Rhinelander is a small, picturesque town in Wisconsin, a state that's famous for its museums and national parks. In the 19th century, Wisconsin's lumber industry was a leading producer of pulp and paper. Today, it's a prime destination for visitors to the northern United States. Its forests and lakes are a huge draw for tourists, but one place, Rhinelander, is a star attraction. The city is located in Oneida County, where rivers, lakes, and swamps make up about 10% of the region. Summer or winter, there's always something here to satisfy every vacationer's needs. But that's not the only reason people come to Rhinelander. According to local legend, a terrifying creature stalks these swamps and forests. Not only has it been spotted by eyewitnesses for over a hundred years, but one has even been captured. I think it's out there. It's in the woods. On one of my evening strolls nearby here, as I was walking past a swampy area, I was stopped dead in my tracks. Then it dawned on me that I'm looking at a creature that is very, very unique, if not the only one of its kind. And there are even rumors early on that he ate human flesh. And as a little girl, I'll tell you, I, I seen him. I truly believe that I've seen the hot egg. It's black. It has horns up its back, big, big claws, a horn on its wrist. We do on occasion receive complaints, concerned citizens calling in about the mysterious creature. This object was coming closer, and here's these red eyes. Claws ripped the belly from any beast. It was so scary. Horns running down its back. I mean, this was just this beast coming out of this woodshed. I've been actually searching for the hodag for 40 years. And the hodag came barreling out from the bushes, bit him in half, just like that. According to eyewitnesses, the hodag lives and hunts in deep, dense swamps. The habitat is so impenetrable and difficult to access, the creature has managed to avoid being captured. There are a lot of books written about the hodag. Most of them are somewhat historical about you know, the hodag and the first discovery of the hodag, but all of them are going to have a chapter about modern sightings of the hodag. Uh, and the hodag has been showing up in the media in various places. There's a kid's show that had a, a whole episode based upon the hodag. Eyewitness and newspaper reports describe a hideous creature with the head of a frog, the grinning face of an elephant, thick short legs set off by razor sharp claws, dinosaur like horns running down its back, and a long tail with spears at the end. According to people who have seen the beast, they also say its skin is either black or green. In the late 1800s, a lumberman named Gene Shepard claims to have captured one of the beasts and taken this photograph but some say the black and white picture isn't very convincing. In 1896, supposedly, it's been said that Gene Shepard captured the hodag. And how did he capture it? He had a 10-foot bamboo pole. He had a huge sponge soaked in chloroform. And he managed to find out when the hodag was in its cave and worked his way up there with that sponge and that chloroform and got the hodag to go to sleep. Then he brought the townspeople out there, brought it back to his house and showed it for years and years, brought it around to county fairs and made money showing the hodag. Gene Shepard lived in Rhinelander. The climactic area, the geography, the geology of the area all lends itself to a creature such as the hodag thriving and existing here. Uh, he is seven feet long seven and a half feet long, we're reported about 12 to 1,500 pounds. So it's, it's not something you could hide in the woods, but his camouflage has been, they, they say, very well. What exactly did Gene Shepard find in the Wisconsin woods that day? No other animal has been captured since, and no one has produced any evidence of a sighting. In spite of that, a legend is born, a legend confirmed everywhere one looks in Rhinelander, on postcards, in books, even in the local museum.
There have been people who have come forward with tales that can only, in my opinion, be interpreted as sightings of the Hodag. So yes, we've had young people and we've had older people who will swear that what they heard and saw in the woods was absolutely had to be a Hodag. Every tourist who visits Rhinelander is encouraged to take a cruise on the Wisconsin River. Former Mayor Jerry Scheidel now captains the Wilderness Queen. From a dock in Rhinelander, he takes passengers on excursions up and down the scenic Wisconsin River. Captain Jerry recounts the natural and economic history of the region, but he also uses this opportunity to inject a bit of local intrigue, like Hodag, the legendary creature documented near the turn of the century by lumberman Gene Shepard. Gene Shepard was a man who discovered a hodag, and he found that in the Great McNaught Swamp, just north of Rhinelander. Now, the hodag was uh, something that had never been found before. According to Gene Shepard, he first encounters the beast in 1893 in the McNaughton Swamp, just north of Rhinelander. When he gets home, he sketches the creature, and his story is immediately picked up by the local newspaper. Three years later, he returns to the swamp with several men to try to capture the elusive creature. It was a unique creature, and Gene Shepard decided he needed to make some money off of this creature he found. And so he started to show it at the county fairs right around the turn of the century from 1800s to the 1900s. And he showed it there very successfully and actually made himself a quite a few dollars doing it. However, Gene Shepard was a braggart, a drunkard, a womanizer, and he died broke and divorced. He just didn't know how to handle his money. Right up until his death in 1923, Shepard maintains he did encounter and capture a hodag. Jerry carries on the hodag tradition with today's paying customers, but he adds his own personal touch to the legend. Turn it this way, Matthew. Pretty fast. And Matthew, are you from the area? Are you from here? No? Stevens Point. Stevens Point, huh? Do you know about the hoed egg? Yeah. Oh, do you like the hoed egg? Yeah. It has bugs on its back. Yeah. Jerry isn't just fooling around when he tells his audience that the creature exists. He really believes it. Because one day, just like Gene Shepard, Jerry came face to face with the monstrous creature. Now, I mentioned back at that island that this could be the area where a hodag would be sighted. Well, it's possible. It has water, and a hodag does enjoy some clams and mud turtles and a few water snakes. But it likes a nice swampy area. And I have to tell you, one day I was out walking in an area that was fairly swampy. And as I'm walking through the woods, I'm enjoying the beautiful evening. It's gonna be an evening just like today. And I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the peace and quiet of the walk. And all of a sudden, I am stopped short in my tracks, like dead in my tracks, because a smell assaulted my nose. A stink that could only be described as so strong it would drive a skunk off a gut pile. I mean, it was bad. I stopped. I moved forward quietly and carefully. And upon rounding a bend, I could see this, this aberration coming through the woods. Because it was a little bit foggy that night. And here it comes walking down the pathway. And as it gets closer, I notice that its eyes were glowing green. That its nose was flaring red. And as it appeared closer and closer, all of a sudden, with cat-like agility, it sprung upon a log right in front of me. And that's when I saw the huge, huge claws. Claws so big it could rip the belly out of the biggest beast. That's when I saw the horns running down its back, ending in a fistful of those needle-sharp points at the end of its tail. And that's when I very carefully, trying not to move at all for fear of what might happen, I reached into my top pocket and I took out my iPhone and I commenced to take as quiet a picture as I possibly could and then without making any sudden movements, 
I very carefully backed away from that critter and hightailed it out of there. Jerry Scheidel and Gene Shepard aren't the only ones claiming to have encountered the Hodag. One day, a young girl named Desiree French has a similar experience in the forest near Rhinelander. I enjoy walking in the woods. It's a sense of quietness, I don't know. I, I like to see what all can pop out when you're just sitting there. Well, it was uh, nice and sunny out. Uh, it was around dusky, though. Well, I got done with supper, and I didn't have any homework, so I decided to go down there and sat up in my favorite tree like I do any other time. And I saw him. He was black, very black. Uh, lots of spikes going. He had two on his head, and then at least 15 going down to his back, and up. Uh, quite a few on his tail. The claws were, I don't know, about probably about that big on each paw. He had about three of them and then one like on his back there. Uh, it was scary. So, like I kind of froze up and then I'm like, I gotta get out of here. I know that there were have been a few bears down there. So when I hopped out of the tree, I I wanted to make sure that what I saw was correct, and when I went down there, it, it was definitely a hot egg, flaring red nostrils, the stench was horrendous, and uh, it I, I knew what I saw and I ran. At night, I I don't go out, I know that's when he likes to go out to hunt, so I, I just keep away from the swamps at night. I wrote about the Hodag because I'm from here, because it was a way of incorporating stories that I know. I am a Hodag. My family goes back to 1890 census in Rhinelander. And a Hodag's been part of my life all my life. My parents were Hodags. They went to high school here. My grandparents. I use everything. I take the bare bones of the Hodag story and add things that could be true. We have a story about the uh, funeral of Shorty Matusak. There's not too many stories known, true stories, about uh, what happened to some of the victims of the Hodag, but Shorty Matusak was a victim of the Hodag. He was a fireman on the train, and the train used to stop at a little town called Roosevelt on the north side of the Moon's Chain. So the red light was out, the train stopped, Shorty Matusak was the fireman. There was nobody at the station. It was a dark and foggy night. He left the train, which was his mistake. He looked to see what was going on up and down the tracks, and the hodag came barreling out from the bushes, bit him in half, just like that. Now, the only thing about this is he had to be buried. And of course, Father Himmelsbach had to come and say, okay, we can have an open casket, but it's not often that you have the bottom of the casket open. Of course, that's all that was left to a shorty was the bottom. So they put a, they tacked a little uh, satin curtain at the top so you couldn't lump in there. And he wore new shoes and everybody came to the funeral of Shorty Matusek, bitten in half by the hodag. It's, it's a family secret. We can't really tell much um, that, um, you know, where to see the hot eggs. So, you know, some people think maybe it's a hoax, but it's a family secret. It would be like telling where your favorite blueberry patch was. You just never, never talk about that. Rod Umloff is a nature artist who has spent years painting the Rhinelander hodag but they aren't just products of his creative imagination. Rod has actually seen the strange creature that inspires some of his canvases. Our family would come up to northern Wisconsin. We'd have campfires at night. We'd be camping or um, staying in the cabin. And my uncle, he loved to tell ghost stories. I mean, he was the type that'd tell us a I mean, really scary story and then take us to a cemetery and make us walk, walk through the cemetery. So there's this noise in, in the woods and this object was coming closer and here's these red 
eyes. And as it got closer, it's making these noises and it, it smelled bad, not like a skunk, but, and there's these horns out of its back and it's making these really strange noise and we got really scared. But we thought kind of, was like, I mean, Uncle Dick's always playing these jokes, um, but we could tell he was not expecting this. And uh, he picked up a rock and threw it at this creature. And, you know, I th thinking back, I think those red eyes were just a reflection from the, the campfire. But that image in my mind, you know, I was, you know, pretty young, six, seven, but that was my first experience with the whole day. About 10 years ago, I was snowshoeing, and in the evening, I saw a group of, of hodags, not, not close, but they were, were there's there a lot of dead trees, and I was up on a hill, so I was just like, unbelievable. Because, you know, I'd heard stories about the hodag, but people would, you know, just talk about one, but here there's, you know, a, a group of them. And I wasn't sure whether to call it a herd of hoed eggs or a, a pack of hoed eggs. Um, but that was about 10 years ago. So of course, I had to, had to paint that. Following that early experience, Rod has childhood nightmares about the hoed egg. At first, he suspects his mind is playing tricks on him or that his uncle staged the creature's appearance to frighten him. But his later sighting of a group of the creatures turns him into a firm believer. Most of the time, Rod illustrates the beast with green skin, but that's mainly for artistic effect. Rod says the animals he actually saw in the forest were darker, more like the creature Gene Shepard and other witnesses claim to have observed. So what exactly did Rod see in the Rhinelander forest that winter? Being an artist, he would rather show than tell. that in Rhinelander, everything revolves around the hodag. Skeptics write it off as a hoax perpetrated over a hundred years ago by lumberman Gene Shepard. But that doesn't explain why the townspeople and tourists are so willing to believe the creature is real. Well, what I found in all my time up here is uh, there's really two types of people when it comes to believing in the hodag. Uh, there are those that just want to believe. Uh, and there's absolutely no harm in that. It's fun. It's 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 a it's a wonderful creature to you know <laughs> share stories about. Uh, and then the second type are the people that are just trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Well, I'm a skeptic, so I don't think there's any proof that's out there. It's all anecdotes. If you start looking at proof, if you start looking at the scientific possibility of a hodag being there, uh, you're, you're not going to have that much to stand on. If you think about it, the kind of one of the big mistakes with the hodag, the story as far as like the reality of it, is that the story is that there was always just one hodag. And so now for there to still be a hodag running around out there today, there would have to be an animal that is about 170 years old that is still out there running around. If you were to look at just simply the scientific evidence of what it takes for a species to survive and the fact that we don't have any photos of them, uh, you can add up things like uh, it's a large creature, it would consume an incredible amount of calories to survive. Probably one of the most famous stories that Gene Shepard came up with when he first was talking about the hood egg was the stench of the creature. <laughs> Well, in the fall, uh, we have hunters that are just completely filling all of the land of, of around Rhinelander that are hunting. And although, you know, maybe a hodag can hide under a bush uh, to be concealed, but if it stinks so much that you can smell it within 100 yards, you'd think sooner or later somebody would say, hmm, I smelled a hodag. I'm going to track it down. I'm going to take a picture of it. And yet I don't see any pictures or what there are. They're stage shots. And those same skeptics ask another question. Now that everyone owns a cell phone capable of shooting photos and video, why isn't there visual evidence of a hodag? That's precisely what Jerry Shadell has with him when he sees the creature. So where is his proof? Alas, upon getting home, 
my battery was dead. While I'm searching for the charger, my cats decided to use the phone as a kickball, and they shattered it beyond belief. But I did see it. It is real. And I only had one cocktail. You'll find some pictures that Gene Shepard uh, himself took of the Hodag, of townspeople standing around attacking the Hodag and so on. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty stiff looking creature. It seems to be uh, taxidermically perfectly sitting there. So I, I'm not sure how much you really want to take this seriously. He was the prankster. He was the father of this great prank. And so I doubt whether he would have admitted exactly that it was a hoax. But certainly, there have been a number of stories that have uncovered it, you know. The more you look into Gene Shepard, the more you're going to find that this guy loved to play pranks. He was a jokester. He, he was you know, a remarkable man. He was a, a very good surveyor of timber, uh, a, a great talker, and a great uh, storyteller. But he's also one of these people, and we all know one of these people, where you can't tell if half the stories that they're telling are really true. Gene Shepard was a prankster, a jokester, and he liked to brag, but he also liked to promote the area he was in. Forestry has been the main source of income for the area. Perhaps lumberman Gene Shepard invents his story to revitalize local industries as the forests are being overharvested. Or perhaps Shepard sees the hodag as an opportunity to line his own pockets with a lucrative sideshow at the county fair. Whatever his motives, today he is hailed as a crafty visionary who replaced a failing economy with a tourist boom. Shepard could never have imagined that the legend of the monster he likely invented would transform his hometown in ways that no one could have predicted. He came upon the idea of trying to pull a great joke, a big joke. He would always dabble in little ones, but he wanted to pull a giant one. And so he came up with this creature and he designed this creature in his head. Then he had somebody actually build a creature for him out of cow horns and cow hides. And he got a very strong smelling uh, liquid from the rendering plant in the area. And he ended up creating this monster and then showing it to people, telling them it was the real thing, that he had found it out in the woods, that it harkens back to prehistoric times. And it's been on the planet for many, many, many years and is very ferocious. The Smithsonian Institute actually sent people up here, and that is when Gene Shepard had to fess up that the whole thing was indeed a joke. I think that absolutely Gene Shepard is probably, um, you know, one of the first ambassadors that we've had for the Rhinelander community. He kind of put us on the map, and he, um, I don't think he probably ever intended to, and I think he probably thought this is going to be hilarious when my friends hear this story about what um, I've just discovered. But he definitely has helped put Rhinelander on the map and has made a name for our community. Rhinelander looks a lot like any other small town dotted throughout the American Midwest. But it doesn't take very long to realize that this one has its very own distinctive local character. It's everywhere you look. Hodag may be a myth or a hoax, but in the town of Rhinelander, the creature seems to tower over everything. As you drive through the city of Rhinelander, you will see pictures of the Hodag almost everywhere you go to include uh, little statues of, of the Hodag itself. The Hodag has been associated with the name of Rhinelander for over 100 years now. And from my experience, it's sort of gone up and down in terms of its popularity. Uh, there was a period 15, 20 years ago where there was, there was a controversy over whether they should paint the Hodag on one of the water towers because, you know, we don't want to have this town become known for nothing but the Hodag. Since then, they've turned around and, you know, the Hodag, there's a massive sculpture of it right in front of the Chamber of Commerce and it's on the water towers and people are proud of it. Uh, and it's it's absolutely a draw to the tourists because it's, it's the lore of a bygone era of the, the lumberjack area uh, that's you know, only a hundred years ago or so uh, that really was what this town in most of northern Wisconsin was built on. People come here to Rhinelander and when they come here to Rhinelander one of the first things they do is stop at the Chamber of Commerce and they take a picture of themselves in front of the giant hodag. 
which is one of the main attractions for Rhinelander and does bring people here because they want to see what is this this myth of the hodag, this story of the hodag. How did it develop? Where was it kept? How was it captured? And of course they need to have a picture of it. The hodag is really one of the things that Rhinelander is known for. A lot of people from Wisconsin, if you say, oh, I'm from Rhinelander or I live in Rhinelander, they'll say, oh, home of the hodag, we know the hodag. We've kind of embraced the idea we are the Rhinelander Hodags. That's our high school mascot. We have the Hodag Country Festival, which is one of the largest country festivals in the state. Bringing the hodag into everything else kind of helps keep the legend going. It's very hard to put a date when you're from here, on when you heard about the Hodag, it's around you all the time. It's on every sign, it's on your tire dealership, it's on a restaurant, it's on everything. So it sort of begins when you begin. Uh, one of the big tourist attractions we have here, of course, is our Hodag Country Music Festival, where we bring in a lot of great country music stars. And then we've got other festivals that take place, uh, Potato Fest, uh, downtown events taking place, art fair. These are all things that take place outdoors because we have such a beautiful area to, to visit. And now we're gonna go over to Pioneer Park which contains the logging museum. And in the logging museum there are artifacts and there's equipment that was used in the early days of logging up here in uh, northern Wisconsin and specifically in the Rhinelander area. The county fair and the Hodag uh, share a history, and here we are in uh, 2013, and the Hodag is back at the county fair. Welcome, welcome to the world famous Hodag Exposition. And it's a popular show at the county fair. So full circle, 110 years, 120 years later, the Hodag's back in town. Who's here to see the Hodag? Yeah! All right. Gene Shepard's hoax has evolved into one of the local county fair's star attractions. It's at events like this that Gene Shepard first displayed his fearsome beast to anyone willing to pay a dime for a peep. Jerry Scheidel has revived this tradition with his own slapstick reenactment for an appreciative audience outside the Rhinelander Museum. When Jerry first came up with his sketch, or his actually a reenactment of Gene Shepard talking about the Hodag at the original Oneida County Fair, uh, he performed that at the latest Oneida County Fair one year ago, and it was a smash hit. If we were to look at a Hodag's heart, it would be black. That's how evil and sinister this creature is. People just love the performance. They love the thrill of the, of the you know, we're going to see a hodag. Uh, Jerry is a great actor, and he really knows quite a bit about Gene Shepard, and he's, I think he's captured sort of the showmanship, the P.T. Barnum quality uh, of Gene Shepard. So, you know, people loved the show. They were flocking. In fact, uh, I think for their final performance of it, they had a couple hundred people that they didn't even fit into the tent where they were performing. It, they had to open the flaps. During the reenactment, we have the carnival barker who's out there trying to sell 
a particular product, in this case, Hodag Magic Elixir Water. Madam, one bottle of Hodag Magic Elixir Water for your husband, and you'll have a new boost in the boudoir. Yeah. I'll take one of those. And then we segue right into a little bit of a story about how the hoed egg was discovered and a little bit of a description of the hoed egg in a humorous manner. Jerry's show was um, very interesting. I've never really seen anything like that. Oh, that's just normal. Normal. Okay. A little help here. And I don't know, it was kind of strange at points. <laughs> so I think people loved it because it was, you know, a touch of old time medicine show history. Uh, and, and, you know, in a, to an extent, everybody just can't wait to go into the tent to see the hodag. On a carnival sideshow basis, if you've ever seen movies about the old uh, circuses and the old fairs around the country, they always had the sideshows. They always had these unique things, the, the bearded ladies, the tall and the thin, and the, the skinny and the short, and the, the, all of these different sideshows that nobody believed for a minute, but they were always fun to listen to the barkers out there talking about it. And then it was always fun to go in knowing full well you were probably going to get ripped off. Claws and our lunches. But there's hoed eggs here in town, too. Why, this morning, someone took my eyeglasses. I think it was a whole day. The Rhinelander area is... A few years ago, we used the Hodag Hunt for a marketing campaign, and Chris Drees was one of our Hodag hunters, and we did television commercials based on the different places that you can find the Hodag. The Hodag is very well known for stealing golf balls, for example. Um, and so we went hunting for the Hodag on the golf course. The Hodag also loves fresh fish, especially fish from the end of your fishing line. So if, if that big one ever gets away, it's not really that the big fish got away. The hodag is, you know, out for a swim and, and took it from you. Chris will definitely take you out hodag hunting, and he's probably one of the, the expert hodag hunters we have in the area. And the fun thing about it is if you can get a hold of him and he happens to be free, there will be no charge, and he will take you to those places in the in the woods, in the water, around town where the hodag is, is best known to be spotted and you have the best chance of finding him. There's never been a confirmed sighting of the Hodag. Uh, only, um, you know, people rumors we have up in the north. So when I came north uh, to northern Wisconsin, I was intrigued, as many other people have been. And I started uh, doing some research. Uh, you know, uh, camouflage is, is very good, apparently, as, as we can see by the, uh, the, the Hodags we have locally. Uh, the, the, the greens and the, and the dark shadows uh, mimic our forest very well. He may right be right behind you, and you wouldn't know. Uh, his scent is, is much stronger than any dog. Uh, it's reported, so when you look for the whole egg, you have to wash your hands very carefully, very, very carefully, and you have to take a breath mint, because they will smell your breath of a human well over a mile away. So that's probably one of the reasons no one actually has seen the whole egg. This is very uh, good hodag country. And we're also going into a swamp area, which uh, most people don't like swamps. So the creatures that live in the swamps are somewhat protected uh, from people who are looking for them. You have to look in unusual places for the hodag. Uh, this was made, and the stick is broken as you can see, this was made by something. You know, whether it was a hoed egg or, or uh, dug by a bear, uh, but it was dug for a reason. This is very important because they may have been here looking for roots. I 
I do not think we should do any actual hunt for the hoed egg because, you know, if you get out in the woods, there might be, uh, you know, there might be real animals out there. You know, maybe there'd be a bear or some mosquitoes or something like that. And so, you know, I just think it would be more trouble than it's worth out there looking. But sometimes, you know, if guests want to hunt down a t-shirt with a hoed egg on it or a coffee cup, you know, something like that, like a hoed egg souvenir, I will tell them where to go because uh, they do sell those at a few places in town and they will go uh, hunt those on down and they are successful every time in that hunt. I would say that there absolutely is a tie um, economically between the hodag and tourism because even for people who Rhinelander may not be their final destination, that means still they might grab lunch. They're still going to try and take home a hodag uh, souvenir with them and, and say that they saw the hodag and get their picture taken. Gene Shepard made a fair amount of money. There was one weekend where he actually, at a dime apiece, brought in $500. Now $500, even today, it's a nice little chunk of change. Back then, it was quite a lot of money. The whole thing you can find on keychains, um, bumper stickers. I, I got a little snow globe with the hoed egg on a it. A snow globe. Anybody who has any kind of business acumen at all uses the hoed egg to promote their business. We have sweatshirts, we have t-shirts, we have, of course, we're in Wisconsin, so we have beer mugs, we have children's stories, so we have a whole line of merchandise called Happy the Hodag that was created by a woman who originally is from Rhinelander, and so Happy's the more children-friendly uh, version of the Hodag. Window clings, bumper stickers, postcards, you name it. If we can put a Hodag on it, we will try. Gene Shepard discovered a very evil, sinister, ferocious animal that just stunk to high heaven. Over the years, in order to adapt and adopt a mascot to the current times, it had to be a little more friendly. And the school, the, the high school, Rhinelander High School, made it the mascot. And that was the beginning of a lot of changes with the hodag, because the hodag was a real monster before that. Uh, you wanted to scare people with the hodag. But after that, after the school adopted it, it became, well, it ate white bulldogs instead of human flesh. And only on Sundays did it eat the white bulldogs. So it was cleaned up a lot. And there's a story about how the black hodag of the North became green. It's a simple story. The Rhinelander High School had green football uniforms. They repainted the hodag. It was a terrible thing for the poor beast. Growing up here in Rhinelander, uh, the hodag was always part of our family. Uh, and we are all very proud of it. It's, it's grown and grown the support for the Hodig. It's just been wonderful. So it turned from black to green and from ferocious and evil to a little more likable. Hodag isn't the only bizarre hybrid creature that supposedly inhabits America's forests. The Jersey Devil is believed to be a cross between a kangaroo, a bat, and a goat. And the jackalope is half rabbit, half antelope. But the hodag is the only creature that's been caught and only one of a handful to have captured the public's imagination and interest. We do um, get asked quite frequently if people were gonna go out and if they were gonna look um, where they might uh, take the kids and what kind of fun things they could do while looking for the hodag. We've been coming up here for years yes. trying to find one. Yeah. Yes, we have not seen it. We've been hunting for them. Yeah. yeah. I've also actually seen the hodag used as a parental tool in that they will tell their children, you know, you might want to watch out and behave and stay in the tent if they're camping tonight because the hodag could potentially, you know, sneak out of the woods or climb out of the lake. And it's always great when kids' eyes get really large and they hear just what might happen when they don't listen to mom and dad. Whether anyone still believes or not, 
Both locals and visitors all agree that the strange legend of the Hodag has left an indelible mark on this little city in the heart of Wisconsin. A mark that has put Rhinelander on the map of extraordinary places. People wonder how it is that the Hodag is alive after over a hundred years. Well, it's got several reasons. The main one being it is a unique creature. There are no other mascots that look like the Hodag, that exist like the Hodag. There are no other creatures that have a myth and a story built up around them over time. And it keeps getting bigger and bigger. USA Today had a contest where you could uh, vote online. In Wisconsin, we were considered the most unique mascot in the, the state. So it's an absolutely wonderful uh, bit of lore and a great, uh, great name of a creature that a lot of people have tapped into uh, and have carried on with the myth. The mystery of the Hodag is something that is just a lot of fun and it's something unique and it's not something that anybody else can say that they have. And so um, whether you believe or don't believe, it's a little bit like Santa Claus. I think, you know, kids will always believe in Santa Claus until they're told differently. So um, we, we treat the Hodag sort of the same way. The Hodag like gives us more pep. I mean, makes, this makes the city a cooler. I don't know. I I'm trying to explain this. It, it brings recognition to to the tone of Rhinelander. Plus, then we can make T-shirts about it and sell it. I think it's a great initial hook. I think people really kind of get into it. I think that they they come here, they enjoy it here, they have a great time, and the fact that there is no hot egg at the end of the day really doesn't matter. It's as real as, as you want to make it, and kids love it. I mean, we have storybooks about it. Um, they did a Scooby-Doo episode about it. So in, in Rylander Hearts, it is real. It's real to all of us. Over the years, because we have mellowed the image of the Hodag down so nicely, uh, it's just a more lovable, more mellow, more interesting creature to adopt and to like. And so people have, they've taken to it. If you want to believe, you'll believe, ultimately. Uh, it's fun, it's, it's the whole mystique behind uh, the creature, the hodag, the lore of uh, the 19th century lumbermen, and if you want to believe, you're gonna believe it. state of New South Wales in Australia, an incredible creature roaming the tropical forests where few dare to tread. From out of nowhere, this animal just came and pounced and grabbed it around the neck. Here, it's called the thylacine. Something jumps out from the gloom and disappears. It could jump like a kangaroo, but it could walk like a dog. They were really inter interested in the blood. Yes, I've seen something like that too, but I didn't want to, didn't want to say anything about it. Byron Bay, Australia, a paradise for surfers and nature lovers. This popular seaside resort attracts over a million visitors each year. These tourists don't suspect that just a few meters from the beaches, a mysterious beast, a cross between a tiger, a dog, and a kangaroo, freely roams the rainforest. Residents believe that this is a thalassine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger a creature thought to have disappeared from the Australian mainland over 4,000 years ago. Wendy Bethel organizes nocturnal guided tours in the jungles of Byron Bay. One night, she had the surprise of a lifetime. I take people out into the rainforest with the night vision goggles, um, and uh, we go looking for animals. So we see lots of normal Australian little animals. 
Uh, we were looking at the at the paddy melons. There was maybe about six of them just grazing on this clearing, and then uh, from out of nowhere, this animal just came and pounced on one of the paddy melons and grabbed it around the neck. And and I just I just took me by surprise. So it was that stealthy, whatever it was, that even the paddy melons who hear one twig break and they're out of there, it it didn't hear it. I've been running tours out there for seven years, I've been going out, you know, into the rainforest, you know, three or four times a week, and that's the only time I've seen something that I couldn't explain. And I identify animals all the time, and so I'm used to looking at something and, tr and, and working out what it is I'm seeing, like you're listening, you're looking, and you're identifying attributes of the animal. I was going through that process and, I, and it, it didn't work. I was sitting there going, what was it? And then screamed, you know, let it go. And then it just ran off. I was thinking how cool it was that I'd saved the little paddy melon <laughs> from being eaten by something. Um, but then I started thinking about it, you know, what was it that I saw? And, that, and I still don't have an answer. Gary is, a, is a, one of the great people in this area knowing wildlife and, um, and so I was talking to him about it. He suggested what I seen might have been a thylacine. <laughs> Of the 317 animals that I'd received information on during the 17 years of my radio program, I'd also received reports on animals unknown to science. The cryptozoologist Gary Opit hosts a popular show on animal life on Australian public radio. He firmly believes in the existence of the thalassine. I also received phone calls from farmers and uh, forestry workers National Park Rangers and uh, just local people who have seen animals that uh, are believed to be extinct. One of the most remarkable animals of all is the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger. Bruce Pringle is a sculptor whose work is inspired by the thylacine. For him, Byron Bay is more than the home of the mysterious creature. It's a paradise a place to be truly free. It's very precarious, little Bar Byron Bay. It's, it's this beautiful, sensitive, fragile beach and a little town. A lot of the people here are traveling through. Everybody's on holiday. Everybody's here expecting to have a good time. They're relaxed. So you walk down the street, there's a lot of people there in party mood. It's, re yeah, it's very pleasant. You know, it's just, uh, it's a fantastic beach every time you go up to the lighthouse. There's, there's a, an osprey, an eagle, you know, or, or a turtle in the water down there, or dolphins out there, or whales out there. And, and a lot of people come here looking for a bit of spiritual something, you know, because there's, it's that kind of feeling here. It's, uh, there's something, something here that lets you open up a little bit. It's, it's, it's a great place. You just see people doing all sorts of crazy things here. You see, uh, there's a guy that walks around by him with a llama, like walking it like a dog, you know. It is an interesting place. The actual town of Byron Bay itself really only has 5,000 residents who live here, but we have 1.5 million tourists a year. <laughs> We've been doing this publication since 84, our little Byron, we call a Byron guy, which is stories about the spirit and feeling of Byron, you know? And what I think keeps us going after 31 years is we still haven't sort of nailed it because it's so diverse. And we say, oh, well, it's a place for retirees, it's a place no. for young people. <laughs> is it surfers? I mean, people come from all over the world to surf here, which was sort of the, the, the first thing that happened here was the surfers. People uh, come because they can be themselves and people yeah. change their lives. They come here, fall in love with the place. Literally, it's just every story that you hear, someone arrives from Adelaide, and just decides to stay. Somehow it gets under your skin and people feel free to change their name, change their occupation and be who they want to be and, and this place allows that. So look in the back of our local free weekly independent paper called The Echo and you will find every kind of alternative healing medicine you want to ever think about. Acupuncture, <laughs> Chinese herbal therapy. But local newspapers aren't only interested in alternative lifestyles. Here, the thalassine, nicknamed the Tasmanian tiger, regularly makes headlines. Strange sights in the Australian bush. Tiger outside their tent. 
woman claims they saw a Tasmanian tiger. Credibility given to tiger sightings. Beast of Buddha am on the prowl. Genuine thylacine spotters earn their stripes. Panther or thylacine prowler gets around. Our uh, bulletin magazine uh, at one time uh, offered $1.25 million for evidence of thylacine surviving to the present. And if we do find evidence that it exists, it'll, it'll certainly make worldwide news. Gary Chigwidden is editor of the Byron Shire News. A skeptic at heart, he has nevertheless covered several stories related to the thylacine. Well, some years ago, um, and I was listening to local ABC radio, and uh, Gary Opert is a wildlife man who had a regular spot at that time on the radio. Uh, spoke about a man from Mullumbimby who said he saw a thylacine or a Tasmanian tiger. And, my, and being the editor of the paper, my ears pricked up and said, "Oh, this could be a, this could be a good story." It was three o'clock in the morning when Mick and Fabi saw an animal coming towards them along the side of the road as they were driving north. If it's not a dingo or a dog of any kind, its ears were well rounded and it was a lime gold colour. The tail was amazing, it was so long. As the car slowed down, Mick, who was sitting in the passenger seat, said he was less than two metres from the animal before it disappeared into the bush. And since that sighting, he said he had spoken to at least 10 other local people who had made similar sightings stretching back a number of years. He, he was pretty sure he saw something that wasn't, that wasn't a, um, it wasn't, a regular, it wasn't a dog or a regular thing that he'd seen. Uh, and he was fairly convinced uh, after doing some research that it, it was a uh, Tasmanian tiger, a thylacine. They weren't spinning me a yarn. They weren't just inventing a story. They, they were convinced they saw something, uh, something a little bit different. So I, I spoke to Gary Opert, and, who told me afterwards that there'd been a fair number of sightings in that area. Uh, of a particular animal that looked like a thylacine. Um, and of course, when I ran the story in the Byron News, uh, it prompted other people to call me or contact me to say, oh, well, yes, I've seen something like that too, but I didn't want, to, didn't want to say anything about it. That is what a Tasmanian tiger or thylacine looks like. How could a creature thought to be extinct for thousands of years resurface on the Australian continent? The only surviving thylacines were found on the island of Tasmania, south of Australia. They were known as aggressive predators before the islanders hunted them to extinction. The species was officially declared extinct in 1936. The Tasmanian tiger uh, is a marsupial and it looks very much like a dog and so it's been known as the marsupial dog or the marsupial wolf uh, and it's often referred to as the tiger because it has stripes on its back. The last thylacine images date to the early 1930s. But then, what have all those witnesses actually seen? Biologist Mary Gardner is interested in endangered species. She admits to having been shaken by some of the sighting reports. I, I walk through the area all the time and one of the most exciting things is actually spotting the wide variety of different wildlife and there's lots of it and you get to expect certain things and you can also be surprised in spite of your training to see things that um, you wouldn't think are possible. It's a typical kind of story. It was uh, twilight, it was dusk. Every good story starts that way. Going along between the edge of the pavement and the uh, forest, something jumps out from the gloom and disappears again. The creature was caught in the headlights. And I thought, oh, that's very strange. And it didn't do anything that I thought it would, and it disappeared. And it was later that I went through ticking the boxes, trying to figure out what it was. And I thought, oh, that doesn't make sense. So that's, that's the mystery. Because what I ended up thinking I saw was um, a thylacine. What else has those kind of ears, that kind of bony rump, and the tail stripes, and that very rigid, strange tail? I rang up my friend Gary Opet, and I said, 
you've been here a long time, you've seen lots of things, what do you think? And he said, well, we just have to put this in my catalog of anecdotes. And there are, he's got quite a catalog of anecdotes. Majority of people living in cities, they don't really know what a Tasmanian tiger or a thylacine is. When they phone me up, they, they don't say, oh, I've seen a thylacine or I've seen a Tasmanian tiger. They say some mad person has, has bred a kangaroo and a dog together. You'd think it was going to be a dog, but it wasn't, and it wasn't a kangaroo. Well, it looks very much like a dog, more than anything else. It, it had a tail like a kangaroo, it could jump like a kangaroo, but it could walk like a dog. This here is a photograph that was sent to me by one of the, my listeners, and it shows you the uh, redneck wallaby that had been eaten on the grass outside his window under the clothesline. They hadn't heard anything and it had made an incision down the belly and it had, it, it had bitten out the stomach and taken it and placed it a little further away and it had eaten the intestines and all of the organs, the lungs and heart and, and uh, kidneys and liver. Uh, and didn't touch uh, any meat on the body at all. It was, it was typical of the way that the thylacine is said to, to have hunted. They were really inter interested in the blood and the real high protein food, the, 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 the organs, the, the heart and the liver and the kidneys. That, that's very good evidence that it may have been a thylacine. And many residents of Byron Bay share Gary Opitz's views. I think it could still be out there. There's a lot of space for them to be hiding, so yeah. it could be out there a somewhere. Hideaway. A few, quite a few people spotted them, and then one guy said, "That was just my dog," but it wasn't. Like he was, his dog was a um, Labrador. <laughs> like it's just a Byron thing. Like <laughs> we set up a camera trap or several camera traps, just in the hope that uh, we might be able to photograph. Uh, one of these animals had been reported to us. And this is the only photograph that uh, anyone's ever been able to take of the thylacine or a thylacine-like animal. Open-mindedness is a key feature of the residents of Byron Bay, according to Bruce Pringle. Australians have nicknamed this area of New South Wales the Rainbow Region because of the many hippies who have taken up residence there. No wonder they believe in this mysterious creature. People are here because they want to be here. You know, there's not a lot of jobs here or, or anything, so you, if, you, if you want to live here, you've got to try really hard, you know? You, it's, it's, you, there's problems, you know? You've got to find employment and stuff like that. So the people that are here have worked something out, you know, and they're independent-minded people. Michelle Dawson is an artist who embodies the free spirit of the region. This mythical creature fascinates her. I do have a bit of a thing for monsters or mythical beings. So a great love of sort of myths, legends and fairy tales kind of imbues a lot of the work. And animals that I'm really drawn to improbable looking creatures. So things that look proportionally wrong or like they shouldn't really exist. Australia's got a strange thing of sightings of creatures in their outback. There's a certain magic. You feel a certain magic about the possibility that you could be walking through the bush and experience that creature. I think, I do think it's exceptionally beautiful. You know, the head and the ears and the eyes and then those stripes and this idea that there was this um, creature that sort of looked like a wolfish dog with tiger stripes that was a marsupial with a backwards facing pouch just seemed incredible. Shortly after I came here that there was a spate of people claiming to have seen it here and that, that's quite interesting in that those sightings go back to the early 60s. And when you read the descriptions, <laughs> that you have to actually say that they, they really, really clearly describe a Tasmanian tiger. It does disturb and surprise me when I see that on a general level, how little people know of it. 
There's good cave drawings of it. It just goes back so far, you know. But it did last for so long before we turned up, really. In Berlin, at the Museum of Natural History, the Australian paleontologist Michael Archer shares his passion for the thalassine. It makes me extremely sad. Uh, apart from seeing the most amazing animal in the world stuffed standing in a case when it should be live next to me, uh, when I read the label, the label says they went extinct because people changed the environment in which they lived. That's not why they actually went extinct. They went extinct from lead poisoning. We shot them all to death. The last remnants of the tiger in this part of the world were down in Tasmania. And then uh, when white settlement happened there, um, there was a bounty put on the Tasmanian tiger because they were eating the farmer's sheep, you know, and, and so the tiger had a go. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the uh, thylacines were killed then, were shot off, and, uh, and, you know, you got money for shooting them. Uh, and also disease crept in, um, we think, um, and, and at some stage or other, they reach that uh, biological critical minimum where they just don't exist. So to cut a long story short, it's by the human hand that, that, that the thylacine is pos quite likely no longer here. The idea that they would actually literally hunt it to extinction, put a bounty on its head and wipe it out, that, that those early settlers in the main didn't see it as wondrous, they just saw it as a threat. Um, and maybe because it was so strange looking, that fear of the unknown. I think the global obsession with thylacines goes into this zone, fascinating zone, of cryptozoology. Um, we find people on every continent have imagined very strange creatures like Loch Ness Monster or like Yetis and things, and they've grabbed them and they want to believe they actually exist. Um, in the case of the thylacine, there's no question about it. We know it existed. The argument is whether it still exists. So those same people who want Yetis to be alive and the Loch Ness Monster to do his swimming in that loch in Scotland want the thylacine to be alive. These cryptozoologists get to be extremely serious, devoting their whole lives to the search for any evidence that would convince someone else that it's still here. Despite the scientific consensus that the thylacine is extinct, the cryptozoologist Gary Opit hopes to someday prove beyond a doubt its existence. So these two footprints uh, were made by Percy Trezise in 1984 and given to me. Uh, I've had them looked at by other thylacine researchers and they thought they did indeed look like thylacine uh, plaster cast footprints, but the problem with thylacines is they look very much like a dog and the footprints um, resemble dogs as well. So once again, even having plaster cast of the prints doesn't really prove anything. And Gary Opit continues his research at all costs. In the company of Wendy Bethel, he takes us into the tropical forests of Byron Bay. Today, I'm going to guide us into a piece of rainforest that I've never taken, into, taken anyone into before. And uh, it's particularly interesting because I've received several accounts of thylacines from that locality from several different witnesses. Here around Byron Bay, out in the hinterlands, there's some forests around here and some gullies and some bush and some rainforest around here. There's incredibly dense, wild country. Nobody goes, there's no cows, there's no sheep there, there's no dogs, there's nothing. You know, people don't go there rarely. A few occasional, occasional hippie will go wandering down there. You know? And if one of those guys or woman says to me, I saw a thylacine, I'm gonna say, yeah, cool. You know, don't tell anybody else. <laughs> Gary Opitz's approach, meanwhile, is serious. He makes regular trips to the densest parts of the forest. Where we're going, it's a patch of undisturbed coastal rainforest dominated by bangalow palms. So it's a perfect habitat for native Australian animals and maybe even thylacines. We only discovered this forest 
by looking on the computer on Google Earth, examining the, our local area and found a rainforest we didn't know existed park here on the right. So we always need our backpack in which we've got a pair of binoculars and a camera, a bit of water and a bit of insect repellent just in case uh, there are too many mosquitoes. And uh, all we have to do now is cross the road and head into the rainforest. This is the locality where there have been reports of thylacine-like animals, so perhaps there's one of those lurking just ahead. Oh, there's a real track in here. <laughs> Directly to the west of us, a local farmer on two occasions driving his tractor very early in the morning uh, in encountered an animal very dog-like with very distinct stripes on its back. Uh, and he was very sure that he was looking at a thylacine. And if it was in that open grassland just over there, then this would be part of its hunting territory. And it could move for scores of kilometres uh, along the coastland and inland on these wildlife corridors. So now we've come to the wonderful Bangalow rainforest. This is the kind of country that they would very likely uh, forage through looking for small animals, rats, mice, bandicoots. One of the reports that I received was of a farmer walking through some forest near his farm and in the base of a tree he found two animals around about the size of a small cat uh, with stripes on their backs and he realised he had found a couple of young thylacines. He had a good look at them and then off he went. If he'd picked those animals up he would have made one of the greatest zoological discoveries on earth. The thylacine now would be a known surviving animal and uh, there'd probably be an intensive breeding program with them. So is it possible, is it, is it possible that there's something out here or that there's still thylacines in, a, in the world or around here? It's, I, I, it's certainly possible, but is it probable? Anyway, we'll continue on. There's nothing like going off the beaten track with you. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> So from this side of the creek, we get a wonderful view of the rainforest. This would be perfect habitat for it uh, because it could hunt along these uh, grassy areas beside the creek and then it can c cross back into the forest on these fallen trees. I just find it that every single time someone sees one that, that no one's able to photograph it or um, it's it sort of you know everyone's got camera phones and and walks around with cameras so why isn't there any photographic evidence in the rainforest of Byron Bay Gary Opit and Wendy Bethel continue their research in the hope of one day seeing a thalassine now, Wendy's deep in the forest, she doesn't know when, where she, we are. And so the Aboriginal people uh, had a particular call they used to use to um, find one another. And Australians have used it ever since. And it goes like this. <coughs> the witnesses usually say that they can move with incredible speed and make very little noise. You can hear how much noise Wendy's making as she moves through the forest and Wendy's used to walking through the bush and that's one of the, the problems finding animals walking through a forest is that the animals can generally hear you coming. 
Isn't that a magnificent strangling fig tree? The largest tree in the forest. So I think the time has come for us to leave this wonderful palm grove and climb up into the old sand dunes. And a few short meters from this rainforest, the beach completely deserted. This just gives you an idea of how fabulous this coastline is. As you can see, almost no sign of civilization, no tourist resorts. Uh, very fortunate we have this magnificent ocean beach. According to OPIT, human activity is so limited in this corner of Australia that it would not be surprising if a thalassine were hiding in the region. But today is not the day for him to make this incredible discovery. So now comes the most dangerous part, crossing the road without getting run over. So this is a, a lace monitor or tree goanna. It's obviously the victim of a car strike. We didn't spot any thylacines or anything else but it's very difficult to come across animals when you're walking through the bush like that. Hopefully, one day, we'll find a thylacine. <laughs> I, I, hope you, I hope we do. Yeah. <laughs> According to paleontologist Mike Archer, Gary Opit will never realize his dream of capturing the creature. Where's the hard evidence that it's still out there? Where is the squashed carcass on the road? Since 1930, with all of the vehicles in Tasmania killing everything else on a daily basis, why not one thylacine carcass? People say they see them everywhere. They see them on the mainland of Australia. I've, I've had people tell me they see them in Texas and even in South America. But it's all based on sightings. And sightings are not testable evidence. It's not the same as a bone or a hair or even a, a piece of poo. What you can do is examine the structure of the sighting. And when you do that, it turns out that the way people see thylacines, the time of day, the number of people who see it, the length of time of the duration of the sighting, it's the same kind of data that we have for flying saucer reports. So it makes people extremely skeptical that sightings are a credible basis for claiming they still exist. And apart from the sightings, there is zero evidence, zero hard evidence, that a thylacine survived in Tasmania after 1936 or on the mainland after 4,000 years ago. They're gone. I, I am very skeptical that they were so awesomely bright that they have made a collective decision since 1936 to never allow anybody to see them. They're just not there anymore. We have to get over it. But in 1996, the discovery of a thalassine carcass shook the scientific community and revived Gary Opitz's hopes of conclusively proving the existence of the creature. They did find a perfectly mummified carcass or body of a Tasmanian tiger in the Nullarbor Plains in Western Australia and it was in perfect condition, it still had the fur on it. They did a radiocarbon date on some of the skin and the, uh, the date received was 3,000 years old. Some friends of mine had found a mummy of a thylacine on the floor of a cave, appropriately called Thylacine Hole, on the Nullarbor in the southern part of the continent. At first they thought it was evidence that the thylacine had just recently fallen into the cave because it still had eyeballs, it had a tongue, it even had a musty smell and they were ready to start to establish a reserve to protect the thylacine. It was such an exciting time. And then one paleontologist, Duncan Merrilies, said, hang on, before we jump to this conclusion, we should probably radiocarbon date the tissues, the dried skin. Um, and they did, and it turned out to be over 4,000 years old. But then 10 years later, they found a dingo completely rotted away in the same caves. And then they began to believe that the cave floods every year. So it couldn't possibly be 3,000 years old because the, the dingo carcass uh, could only be 10 years old and it had rotted away to a greater extent than the thylacine carcass. So, so it's a controversy. <laughs> I don't want to say that nobody has ever seen one. 
Our problem, for those of us who would love to know it is still out there, is that we need somebody to show us hard evidence. There are well-known mental phenomena that basically involve people seeing things that they, they love or they severely miss, somebody whose, whose loved one has died. Something like 10% of people will see that person on the street within a month. And if you really want to see something badly enough, your brain is designed to fill in the gaps. If you see an animal in the bush that's dog-like, your brain may add the stripes if you really want to see a thylacine. It's a very flexible organ. It's part of the reason why, frankly, seeing is not necessarily believing. Now, most people, uh, as we know, believe in shooting the messenger. If you don't like the news, then you blame the person that's delivered it. So if someone says that they've seen something that you don't believe could be possible, then you'll refuse to believe it and, and accuse the person of, of fabricating the, uh, the, uh, the report. If you receive enough of these reports, you know that there's, there's evidence coming in because the signal is continuing. You, you continually receive dissimilar descriptions from people who have never met each other, who are not interested in, in, in the animal, but they are interested in an identification of something that is peculiar, a, a creature that they didn't know exist. I would like to find evidence one way or the other as to whether they exist or not, but uh, I, I cannot come up with a conclusive statement that it definitely exists or that it doesn't exist. All I can say is the anecdotal evidence shows that it exists because people continue to describe uh, really detailed observations of the animal. Outside the scientific debate on the current existence of the thalassine, Michelle Dawson focuses on its place in the hearts and minds of Australians. It just seems like a really miraculous being. Marsupial, tiger-striped, dog-headed, backwards-facing pouch creature. You know, they were supposedly wiped out because they thought they were killing the sheep, but um, later research and science would show that they're an incredibly shy creature that lived mainly way up in the highlands and very rarely ventured down and lived off small rodents and things. So that this shy, strange, beautiful creature got sort of willfully wiped out seems just ineffably sad, really. And an idea that it might have survived would be beautiful. I think a lot of Australians would like to think that it was still there. It's not like they've been extinct for centuries, so, so there is still that, well, you know, if somebody took a pregnant mother away to the mainland, or if two of them hid away in the up in the highlands of Tassie. This, this, not that long ago that the last one was seen. There is still, it's still possible that it could still be here. The scientist Mike Archer nurses a highly controversial dream to one day revive the species through DNA cloning. In 1990, I saw a little tiny baby thylacine preserved in alcohol in a jar in the Australian Museum. I was very excited. I knew alcohol was a DNA preservative. I asked colleagues, was there any possibility? Did they think? These were geneticists. Could we try to get DNA out of that pickled pup and use it somewhere in the future to bring the thylacine back? They laughed. So when I became director in 1999, I thought, why don't we just give it a go? Nobody else thinks it's possible. Let's start. If we don't start, it will never happen. So I put a team together, and they went into this pickle pup, and they found DNA. We tested the DNA. It was unmistakably thylacine DNA. So we were convinced that we had recovered the whole genome of a thylacine from this specimen, and they checked the teeth and bones of specimens that were already in the museum collection, and they produced better quality DNA. We had, as far as we could see, everything you could need to try to put a thylacine back on the earth again. So I guess at this point, if I ask the same geneticists now, do they still think it's ridiculous? Well, many of them have changed their mind. And in fact, many of them have joined teams all around the world to see if it's possible, 
to bring extinct animals back. Projects are happening everywhere. The, the mammoth, the passenger pigeon, dodos. The thylacine is one of those projects. And at that point, we have a new tool for increasing the biodiversity on the planet by hopefully bringing back some of the most important iconic animals that in particular we, humans, have driven inappropriately into the night of extinction. For Bruce Pringle, the thylacine is strictly an artistic influence, but its extinction has also influenced his work. I did this little sculpture. Um, it's uh, it's the from the from the Bible from the New Testament. There's these three crosses where the Christ was crucified, and there were two thieves that were crucified along with him. And uh, I did this little picture of these three crosses. This little steel thing is pretty rough, with a bunch of thylacines just down at the foot of the crosses. And, and my idea was that, uh, you know, those two thieves were forgiven their sins, but the thylacines had no forgiveness. They weren't, there, there was no uh, redemption for them. In fact, it even says in the Bible, if we're going to get hung up about God's word, that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. God's message to the people who were writing the Bible was, you humans created death, it's your job to undo it. So as far as I'm concerned, we have the holy sanction to try to do this work. If science could, can, could come up with that and clone a Tasmanian tiger, and obviously do another one so they could reproduce, it would be an absolute brilliant thing to happen to Australia. Who knows, maybe they will one day. Maybe there'd be Tasmanian tigers running everywhere. It would be really brilliant, but the thing is what, you know, so it would be lovely to be able to release them down in the west of Tasmania again if, if they're not there already. Uh, it would be a bit of a problem if they are there already and then it's like, hey, you know, what are you doing here? No, I'm a test tube. I'm better than you. you know? I've got better stripes. <laughs> there are those people who say this is not about cloning. It's what they... I think cleverly call clowning, you know, that we're wasting our time because they argue this still out there. We were playing God when we exterminated those species. I'd like to say we should be playing smart human to try to bring it back. Why not? Why not? You know, if we can do this, let, let's do it. I don't think it can hurt. I think if there was ever a community that would really, really want to have a thylacine, <laughs> it's probably us. <laughs> Is the thylacine extinct, or has it been surviving in secret for all these long years? The question divides residents of Byron Bay. You know, there have been sightings over the years, sporadically, but, you know, there are things out there. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what they are, but they're, they're out there, yeah. Is there a thylacine around still? Don't know, you know, down in Tassie, they see them regularly. You hear somebody's seen it. I know that most people I know say if they see a thylacine, they're not going to tell anybody. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either. They will never tell them where they saw it. They will keep very quiet about it. But um, I've seen some strange looking creatures around my property inland, but uh, I've never been able you to identify them. You hear things on your roof at night. You hear things on your roof and there's some... It could be possums, it could be anything. Yeah. There's some koalas there too. Strange they're not, they're not... spirits lurking. <laughs> I think, I think that's the common belief that only pertain to those people who might have seen something. But uh, I think everyone else might say, I think you partied a bit too hard last night. And what were you drinking? And what were you smoking? You know. We know what they look like because there's, there's little bits of film still about of them because they're not that long gone. So maybe they're here. I don't know. hope so. The artist Michelle Dawson admits to being torn by the question. I teach a bit, I do a bit of art teaching, and, I, and in one of the classes a couple of weeks ago, I, um, a young guy just really adamantly said that his friend had seen one. And I hadn't heard a sighting for quite a while. I think in my heart of hearts, I think it's extinct. But then when I read those accounts where people just talk about the shorter front legs and the stiff tail and the stripes and the strange gait and that's such clear descriptions that you almost have to go, well, it's kind of, they're almost hard to discount. People in Asia are convinced there are yetis, and people in Scotland are convinced there are Loch Ness monsters, and in North America there is Bigfoot. You can never prove that something doesn't exist. 
the only thing you can do is prove that it does exist. And if you haven't been able to do that, then you're in the zone of cryptozoology. And I hate to say it, that seems to be where the thylacine believers are actually operating. They believe it exists, and that belief trumps the lack of evidence. But for scientists, we need the evidence, and that unfortunately trumps the belief. We have to accept that the only credible evidence we have argues thylacines were gone by 4,000 years ago on mainland Australia, and then only survived in Tasmania until we came along. Yeah, we, we've made bad mistakes. We're a little bit more careful now. It's good. It's good. We're learning. You know, there's hope for us because we are smart. You know, we're really clever. We're really clever. We're bright. You know, is is a it's a sexy image the thylacine in in our, in our minds. You know, because it's a wolf, it's a tiger, it's got stripes, it's a carnivore, and it's sort of it's really, and it, and it's iconic. It's a beautiful, beautiful animal. But, uh, you know, if it was a small little uh, desert marsupial rat that had gone extinct, who cares, you know? It's kind of, we, we live life so fast, it, it just goes, and million, hundreds, hundreds, thousands of things are going extinct every year on this planet. But, and we don't notice him because, hey, he's a little insect, you know, what does that matter? Little, uh, you know, it might cure all our cancers one day, you know, but hey, psh, gone. We have to learn that what we do with this hand has consequences. Everything we do becomes solid and becomes real. And we have to be careful. And while there remain uncharted forests to trace, Gary Opet continues his quest. The mystery of the Tasmanian tiger continues to grow. And that's why we, we, just, we just keep an open mind and, uh, and keep looking. I love the people here. They embrace nature. They embrace tolerance. You know, beautiful um, sharing people. We still have this reputation that we're like dope smoking hippies. <laughs> It's a crazy place, but uh, it's our crazy place. We love it. In the jungles of Belize, a repulsive gnome punishes those who do not respect the forest. Belizeans are very scared of him. Maybe they even think it's devil's work. If you believe in something strong enough, then you can bring it out. If we don't have a respect, then, you know, he gets mad. Watch out for the Tata Duende. Tata is a little mean monster. Billy's, a splendid small Central American nation located south of Mexico. It's especially popular for its 250 kilometers or 155 miles of beaches overlooking the Caribbean Sea. But Belize, and in particular the Cayo region, has a rich Mayan heritage. More than half of the country is covered by tropical forests protected by the government. But in these lush forests lurks a monster that has fascinated and terrorized Belize for centuries the Tata Duende, a gnome at times good or evil. Grissy G and Dismas grew up here. My grandpa always told stories about Tata Duende visiting the farm. So we grew up with it. Every weekend we'd go visit and we'd hear these stories. So it was very alive in my family. A few years ago, the couple had an experience that left them perplexed. We were driving along the cane fields. It was almost sunset. And uh, Dismas and I were in the back seat. And um, we just started hearing like a little whistle following the car. We could say like we were going maybe 45 miles an hour. And this whistle seemed to be following the right. truck but not following like from behind and just right. tailing just us. Just going with us. It sounds like it's on the wind is a way to explain it. 
and it wasn't like a bird whistle, it's just a strange little hollow whistle. But the thing that was strange about it is that Grissy G's dad and one of his friends was the, were in the front seat of the car, and they did not hear the whistle. And the both of them are like, looking at us as if we were imagining it. We got chills and we were like, whoa. I like to say I'm an open-minded skeptic, so I'll question it to try to find logical explanations. But if we're both imagining it at the same time... And might... hearing it and feeling something weird. It throws you in a thing where you start to question your beliefs and realities, like, is this a possible right. Tata Duende whistle? Or this does give us a, uh, like a push more that maybe there is something more to it than just stories. Right. The million tourists who visit Belize each year have no idea that the country's jungle hides such mysteries. And Belize has one of the most diverse ecosystems in Central America, argues René Villanueva, a journalist and owner of one of the most popular radio and television stations in the country. Of course I love Belize. And Belize is the most beautiful country in the world. The beauty about Belize is that it's 8,867 square miles. If you travel to any country in the world, you will not find the diversity you find in any 8,867 square miles. When it comes to waterfalls, lakes, lagoons, valleys, rainforests, we have it all packed here. The only thing we cannot give you is some snow. And like its landscapes, Belize's population is a mosaic of variety. Besides, Belize is one of the only non-Spanish-speaking countries in Latin America. Belize city was really founded in the 1600s. Well, the Europeans, who were the original pirates, uh, brought across slaves from Africa through Jamaica to work in the mahogany camps. The tropical forests of Belize have long been harvested for mahogany and chicle a time when tales of monsters were very popular. Oh, the myths and legends are numerous. We still talk about Tata do Hende. A, a lot of people, some people use it to frighten their kids. They say, Tata do Hende, I come for you. Because as a child growing up, I can remember hearing all these stories being told. And you actually are afraid. Rosita Arvigo left her native Chicago to settle in the Cayo region and study medicine in the jungle with Mayan healers. She has since devoted her life to the protection of the forest. Her encounter with the Tata Duende was a supernatural event that changed her life. I'm uh, Rosita Arvigo. I'm a doctor of nephropathy. As an alternative physician in the 1970s and 80s, it was rather difficult to practice complementary alternative natural medicine in the United States. I uh, spent 13 years as apprentice to uh, Maya shaman Don Elicio Panti from San Antonio in Belize. The duendes, he explained, are the earth spirits. They're assistants to the nine Maya spirits, and they come to announce the beginning of a dream vision and the presence of the Maya spirits. So I encountered them dozens of times before a dream would begin. So this one night, I was aware of a little body behind me. I looked down and I saw two little hands here and two little feet here. So I turned around and tried to look into this little creature's face and it went right back at me and had this little round face that was all kind of hairy. The feet were on backward and the hand had only fingers, no thumbs. Grissy G and Dismas are on a mission. They have dedicated the last 10 years to reviving the legend of the monster that haunted their dreams as children. We are both artists, animators, and authors. Mm -hmm. We were originally born in Belize, in but we currently Corazal. reside in... Los Angeles. We are documenting the myths that we remember as children to preserve this kind of t uh, telling of the tales. To document these oral traditions that we remember. Even though we live in Los Angeles, um, we can't help, we think about Belize every day. <laughs> so the book is kind of like our way of um, basically giving back to the kids to kind of revive this um, excitement and energy and love for these kind of things that we loved as yes. kids, you know? 
The duo created paintings and an animated film about the Tata Duende. They also wrote a book about the monster, The Legends of Belize. Most Belizean, you ask them about Tata Duende, they'll have a story. Right. So it's like, it's part of yeah. us, it's ingrained. It's so the importance of it is connected to all that we feel that is Belizean. The Tata Duende hides in the jungle, keeping discreet. But unlike other monster legends where descriptions vary wildly, here in Belize, everyone has a clear picture of the Tata Duende's appearance. Most people say that Tata Duende is a little man that lives in the jungle. They're one to two feet tall. He usually has a beard and a hat. And they have four fingers with no thumbs. So the children, whenever they go into the forest, they hide their thumbs because they believe the duende is looking to take somebody's thumb. Uh, there is the, uh, um, the idea that he is a spirit as well, so it's not necessarily a solid entity. Usually his feet are on backward, so if you see a footprint with three toes walking, it's actually the duende going in the opposite direction because his feet are on backwards. In Belize, the Tata Duende is widely feared. In the countryside, many even refuse to talk about it. An obstacle that Grissy G and Dismas had to overcome during their 10 years of research. And while making the book, we interviewed a lot of our Belizean friends, and we'd go on road trips, and people we would see on the roadside and just ask them a question right. and give us something. One guy got mad at us because we asked about Tata Duende, and he, he really got mad at us and yelled at us because he said, um, because we were asking about Tata Duende, we brought that bad spirit to him, and when he went to the jungle, the Tata Duende scared his um, hunt, you know, and the minute he was aiming to get the dare, something happened, he said like a whistle, and the dare went. So he said it's Tata Duende and it's because of us. He believes that the Tata Duende is a, they like to refer it to it as a mala aire, like a bad air, or, and he said that it's everywhere. Yeah, and once you say his name, you're attracting him. But what do the words Tata Duende mean? The Tata Duende, it's an interesting word. Tata is a Maya word that means a very revered, respected elder. The Duende itself, the duende. word, is uh, derived from Spanish, and it's uh, dueño, like a derivative from dueño, which is um, the owner, uh, dueño del monte, he's the owner of the jungle. Right. So it's the great revered master, how is it, it translated? And they are the lords, the duenos, the caretakers of the forest, the waterways, the rivers, the trees, and the plants. For the historian Lita Krohn, the Tata Duende is more than a hideous gnome. It also has an educational role for young people. You know, I've always been a teacher, either at the high school, at the junior college, and a couple um, stints at the university. The kids love these stories. They love these stories. Some of them teach you good manners. Some of them teach you traditions. Some of them teach you, you know, what to say, what not to say, how to behave. I always think of Hansel and Gretel, and they used to say, don't go in the forest. And these parents want to take care of their kids, so maybe they'd say, be careful. And they were right, because being in the forest, there's a lot of dangerous things there. Parents, mothers, and caretakers of children often say, behave or the Tata Duende's coming for you. Finish your meal or I'll call the Tata Duende to come take you. So a lot of these stories too, our grandma would tell us, you know, don't go play back there because the little Duende will take you away right. if you don't behave yourself. You know, sometimes in protecting things, you have to be scary. I think so, there's two sides to Tata Duende. Belizeans are very scared of him, mostly. You don't want to get him angry because, you know, they won't be fun for you. If he doesn't like you and he touches you in a, in a negative way, you'll get a fever, you'll start to feel bad. Don't whistle because that's what he does. You're not supposed to whistle. They can tear your house up at nighttime. They put animal dung in the corn grinder. They uh, urinate on the fire. They put your fire out. They break pots. and He could maybe knock you out, take you to his cave. 
since he has power over the jungle, all of a sudden you might have a beehive following your ass, you know? <laughs> it's just that you didn't know what Tata Duende would do. It was that mystery, you know, that like, oh my God, what could it do, you know? Tata is a little mean monster, but he's been mean to the right people. The Tata Duende calls the Cayo region home. It's located in the western part of the country, one hour from the capital of Belize City. San Ignacio, the district capital, is a quiet town of just 10,000 inhabitants, mostly farmers. This is the market. This is where we get a lot of our healthy, fresh vegetables and produce that keeps us nice and young looking, you know what I mean? Javier Molina works as a tour guide. He's particularly proud of his hometown. What makes San Ignacio different from the other cities is the setting, the natural setting that it's in. This area is very mountainous, a lot of hills by the rivers, the two rivers that come and meet here in San Ignacio and create one of our bigger rivers, the Belize River, the lush jungle that's all around, the greenery. The spirit of Belize is very low-key, laid back, relaxed. You feel like time just is at a different pace here than other places. Very mixed culture, diverse culture. You'll find Hispanics here. You'll find Garifuna people here, as well as the Creoles. I can definitely still find Mayan roots all over Belize. Um, like all of these people come to this jewel that we have here and they share. They become a part of us and they create their own little culture, unique culture that is a combination of all these cultures that we know as Belize now. And it, I love this place. It's just so amazing here. The Mayan presence in the region dates back several millennia. And unlike other similar sites in Latin America, the Mayan ruins of Belize are hidden in the jungle, far from the crowds of tourists. Almost all of Belize was occupied by the Mayans. There were about a million Mayans living in this area known as Belize. And many of their temples still remain. These temples date back over 3,000 years. The indigenous people, the first inhabitants of Belize were the Maya, as far as we know. The archaeologists will say Paleo, Paleo Indians. Okay, well, they were the grandfathers of the Maya then. The Maya people do believe in Tata Duende, and it comes from their religious beliefs, you know. He's gone through the ages, at least 2,500 years. So he's a pretty old, old dude. This is a very rootsy thing. The Catholic Church didn't get into the Tata Duende. But why is there almost no written documentation of its existence? Because the Spaniards came to this world in the 16th century, and before that, all evidence was burned by the Spanish friars, right? All their 100,000 books were burned by Bishop Landa, so there may have been records, but they were all destroyed. But as far as any written documentation or eyewitnesses, it doesn't seem to go back beyond the 16th century. The Spanish friars who originally came here and studied, studied the culture, studied the history, and that myth came out in like the 16th century. It was the first recording of the Tata Duende. All we have are oral versions, oral transition from generation to generation. It was thanks to a strong oral tradition that pre-Columbian culture survived in Belize, and this method of cultural transmission is cherished throughout the country. The different traditions passed down from generation to generation has been oral to stories. Um, I can I remember, you know, my parents and grandparents in the little villages around the fire and telling us stories. Definitely you grew up on a lot of oral traditions, a lot of different stories and folklores, like the Tata Duende and all these different mythical creatures that exist in the forest and in the jungles. The, the coming together of telling these stories is not happening the way it used to happen, and I think it's very important for us to try our best to capture and maintain for our future generations these stories, because if we don't do it now, then they will be lost forever. We'd be boring if we didn't have Tata Duende. Super boring we would be. I think if you ever get rid of Tata Duende, we're not going to be in good shape. We have to keep him right up front. Oral tradition enriches who we are 
and that's part of our Belizean identity, knowing all of these personalities of the rainforest and of the sea and of the river and all these places, because culture is dynamic. So maybe first you had the oral tradition, you know, written, TV. So there are other ways you have to keep moving with the, moving with the times. Hence the relevance of the approach of Grissy G and Dismas, who wished to restore the Tata Duende legend to its former eminence. Do you think the Tata Duende or interpretation will affect our country? I think it's going to bring an interest of another of another scope or another dimension because okay, people come here to see the beautiful Caribbean. You go to the rainforests, mm -hmm. you go to the Maya sites, but this is gonna give a, a deeper insight into Belizean culture. Right. Because we're not just sites, we're like a personality and yes. you know? Very it's true. who it's who we are. Right. We're we're completely different from say someone living in Oklahoma. Right. <laughs> hey, right. These are our monsters. These are right? our monsters. Right. We've got them. We've got a lot of them. How do you feel about people that approach it like it's just a myth or it's just superstition? There's some people that badmouth all these things that they that isn't a straight Christian thing. We're bringing out something that we've grown up with and you'll have the takers and you'll have the people that won't accept. But I think you have to put it out there. It's unique, it's very unique. We have this multitude of folklore characters. It enriches our culture, it enriches everything. Grissy G and Dismas continue their search for the mysterious Tata Duende. In a small village in the Cayo region, they meet Maria Garcia, a Mayan spiritual leader familiar with this jungle monster. We still believe, you know, that everything is alive, everything have a spirit, and that there are special, you know, um, entities or spirits that take care of this land, this forest that we call Tata Duende. We know that he is powerful, we know that he's secret, and that's why we do have a lot of reverence to him, you know. If we don't have respect, then, you know, he gets mad. Of course. Right. It's not that he's bad. It's because he have a mission, you know, he, he wants to, to, to let know his feelings. For Maria Garcia, the Tata Duende is no mere legend. It's a flesh and blood monster. My father used to tell us that. He says, it exists. And then when the religion came in, it's like kind of block it up, you know? And then people say, ah, oh, you know, those are stories, those are legends, that's not real. But he leaves signs that you can see that he's there. Believe me or not, recently, people from my village have been seeing it. Most of the, you know, um, legends or the stories or the beliefs are, they are spiritual. The only trace that you can see is when they play with your horse. When they trim the hair of your horse, then you see that it is physical, that he's there, but he is spirit. It's during the night that the Tata Duende makes its appearance, which often includes braiding the manes of horses. We are farmers, and the horses are the ones that help us in the field. You know, mid, like 12 o'clock in, in the nighttime, you can hear the horse run. Run, run, run. And then my mom says, it's the duende riding. And after the finish riding, you can hear the, you know, the horse blow their nose. And so, you know, like early in the morning, you get up and you come watch on your horse, their hair is trimmed. But they say that they trim the hair because that's where they put their foot. You can come and see how um, he trims it. Wow, so this would be like his little... Um, yeah, his... Um, like kind of stirrups? His, his stirrups? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he puts his foot like this, and they just ride. Rosita Arvigo also lives in the Cayo region, and like Maria, she has encountered the Tata Duende. We once did a um, driveway. The work was started when I was in home. My son was here and he cut down three trees, and every machine that he used broke. 
three times over three days. And when I came home, I said, well, of course that's what's happening because you haven't given an offering or asked permission to the duendes of this forest. Those, that's just one example. You could hear thousands of stories exactly like that. Many things happen, especially accidents, when you're clearing the forest. If you don't ask permission and leave a small offering to the lords of the forest, who are the duendes. And that's why we always, you know, do ceremonies for all the spiritual entities that we have. We just cannot go up there and take, you know, because the banana tree already gave, I will say, oh, that's mine. No. Because if we do things the way it is, by offering, by being humble to them, then he help us protect our fields. But when we don't do things the way it is, then he gets mad. You know, we have a dry season, we have floodings, we have insects coming to eat our fields. If we receive, we have to offer. Chrissy G and Dismas also want to ensure that they're in the Tata Duende's good graces. Like nine different incenses. Wow. And you know, that's to cleanse. When we offer and we cleanse, you know, then we purify ourselves. This is the kopal. That's the kopal. Oh. But it's like a wax. It's a sap. Is it from a tree called Yes, the, this is one of our most sacred trees. That's what we are going to be offering. And this altar, is it um, specially designed for...? Yes, that is how our Mayan people do their altars. We cut it from the forest, from the sacred forest. We ask permission because we are going to be making a ceremony. And so we cut them and we, you know, put the altar so that we can put all what we are going to be offering. And then we are offering a lot of incenses so that he can feel, you know, like rejoiced. He is an artist, he loves music, so he likes to play. So we have to offer him, you know, a guitar. And then cigar, he likes to smoke cigars. I've heard that. So it's tobacco. Okay. Tobacco. And then sweets, because they like sweet things. And then we have a special porridge that we do for them, which is sacred corn, and you put it to boil without anything, then you're going to grind it, and that's especially for them. And these are wine. When you make your offerings, you have your, uh, I would say, internal prayers that you make? Yeah, we do have our prayers. Well, it's passed down from generation after generation. We have to smudge everything too, so that they can know that it's for them. He's possibly watching us now? Yes, he is. Grissy G and Dismas pursue their offering to woo the Tata Duende. But will the mythical jungle monster appear? When we make ceremonies, you know, as soon as we start to put the altar and everything, you can see the difference. If, if it's hot sun, you can see that the clouds starts to get together. After it just rain, then the farmers can plant. This is from the Sipche. This is a very secret plant. And so whatever negative that we have, they get it. So it'd be like a sponge for the negative. I had to like, um, observe your negativity. I would love, you know, the first one to come. We are going to leave this here, and in three days, we are going to bury everything because what we offer is for them, not for us.
Did you notice, Miss Garcia, how the breeze just started blowing and the rain? The rain. And the rain just started to drizzle. Is that? Oh, that's good? Yes, it's good. And that means that? that the elements are happy. The minute I started. The minute it started, the wind just kind of like blew in right through. Started, the horse started walking around the tree. Kind of give you a little weird feeling and yeah. then. It just felt like there's a strong energy. Very strange. We have set borders. We're an independent nation. We have our flag. This is our political identity. But I think we also have a cultural identity. Culture in Belize, and culture in Belize is multicultural. We're having things come from Africa, things come from the Maya, things come from the mixture, the mestizo culture, you know? But the Maya have ingrained a lot of beliefs in our whole system. I don't think you're gonna find Tata Duende in a city. We have had a lot of rural areas for a very long time. I think he's more on the outskirts. Like, most of our folklore, they're not urban dwellers, they're rural. Today, three quarters of Belizeans are Roman Catholic or Protestant, but that wasn't always the case. Most of the Christian evangelists in Belize would say that we shouldn't believe in those things and maybe they even think it's devil's work or that the duende is an evil spirit because they want people to turn away from the old ways and turn their face to the new Christianity. And the belief in those earth spirits is part of the ancient Maya way and part of the ancient Maya religion. They were lesser gods, so to speak. And of course, the modern Christians would rather that the Maya people put all that aside and no longer believe in the tenets of the Maya religion. It's very sad. That's what's happening to the culture. It's gradually being eroded by the uh, needs of Christians to capture souls. But is there any evidence for the Tata Duende's existence? You're kind of looking for a scientific explanation, but there isn't. I think he's got a spiritual identity, and I think he's got a real identity. I think your mind is very powerful. If you believe in something strong enough, then you can bring it out. It is faith in the unseen, mm -hmm. belief in legends, belief in myths. But I see the Tata Duende as much more than a myth because just too many people have had encounters. I have personally haven't met him, but I have seen him. The stories in my family about the Duende were that my grandfather was taken when he was young. He was playing in the woods uh, and he was led by this little creature that just you know, kept calling to him. And different people you would talk to would say, yes, your grandfather was taken. Oh, because people think you're foolish or silly to believe in something that can't be proven, and it can't be proven that there is such a thing as a Tata Duende. It's a belief system. Because if people say they've seen him, all right, you know, who am I to say no? Because your life follows your thoughts. You believe in Tata Duende, then you will see Tata Duende. I guess you either uh, believe or you don't. If you have had experiences with them, and as I have, it goes beyond legend. It's something that you yourself experienced, and it's much, much easier to believe it when you felt it. And of course, that one time that I did see the little duende. I've never seen Tata Duende. I believe in him. I believe there's, there's something, there must be something if he's lasted for so long. You can't really prove the existence of Catholic saints, but lots of people believe in them. Whether myth or monster, the Tata Duende must be reintegrated in the culture of Belize, says Grissy G's best friend. But they've been working on this for a long time, and I think it's such a powerful thing to bring back folklore. A lot of young people today either have never heard of him or in a very vague way, and it's so important to bring that back. Mm -hmm. Not because you need to believe, but because it's it's dogma, it's story. It's, it's all about 
who we are and where we come from and our ancestry and those things should never be lost. That's a part of our identity so I think there's a lot of positive things to Tata Duende. He is anti-destruction of our natural treasure so you know sometimes children learn through fear or you know don't do this because there's a consequence and that's what Tata Duende is about. He's a protector and you know everybody needs a protector. I think he's our first environmentalist and he promotes like moderation. He doesn't mind if you go hunting or if you go picking things from the tree but don't overdo it just take what you need and leave. You don't have to get into big business over the rainforest and I think that's the way the rainforest has survived. I think we need a lot more Tata Duendes. You know, us like indigenous people, we love the forest. The forest is our home. So if we don't care, you know, and take care of it, then what will happen? Right. The future generations are there and we have to leave something for them. Mm -hmm. So it is important to preserve it. So if mm -hmm. this story is to preserve the rainforest or the jungles, it's a good one to teach. If more young people, you know, get into preserving the culture, the environment, our natural resources, you know, mm -hmm. I think we are in, on the right path. Armed with their book and excerpts from their animated film about the Tata Duende, the Tandem Tour Schools, introducing children to this mythical monster. So we are going to stir up some stories and excitement from the kids tonight with Tata Duene. <laughs> Hi guys! Um, now we're here today to share with you what we do. We are artists and animators and we have documented our myths from Belize because we think they are part of our culture that makes this country so unique. And we'll be talking about Tata Duende. So no familiar with the Tata Duende? Good stories or scary stories? Scary. scary. Okay, scary. good, good. Okay, cool. Like we said, some people afraid for it, some people aren't. Some people believe in it, and some people think it's a lone cartoon. Some people believe that Tata Duende is a spirit. Some people believe is they are real, but they know how to hide very well, right? So that only when they choose to appear to you, right? But the truth is that there is something, because the story comes from somewhere, and the story comes from our ancient ancestors. Hit the start, it, start it off, all right, let's go. start um, with the presentation. This is a close-up of what we believe the Tata Duende may look like. We interview people. We talk to people in Corozal, in Belize City, all over, and it's just interesting how, even though they're far away, they're like the characteristics of Tata Duende, they're like the same thing, and these beings are basically the guardians of nature, you know? Um, we do have an, an animated short to show you about the Tata Duende. You guys ready? All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, man. No exam. There are monsters of fairy tales and scary stories, but in Belize there are legends and folklore of terrifying creatures. Creatures so terrifying that accounts of them are passed down from the ancients and these legends continue to be told. Tata Duende is a powerful spirit that protects the animals and jungles of Belize. Be extremely careful to not anger Tata Duende, for his wrath can be deadly. So, thank you guys. So we don't know, go home, we don't talk to our grandparents, we don't know, uncle, and just ask them, bring this culture back. We all have the power to do it. I had a very interesting uh, presentation on Belizean folklore. My parents uh, would also tell me stories uh, as I went growing up. Apart from that, you know, it's put aside. So it's something that needs to be recovered and moved on from generation to generation. And some people might say, oh, they're just stories. But it's a part of the culture when you talk about here in Belize. Children growing up need to know about these things and they need to pass it on to their children. It's part of their history. The next stop on their tour, a return to the capital for an appearance on the popular talk show, Belize Watch. 
The host is also the owner of the premises, Rene Villanueva. We started this organization 22 years ago in the ground flat of our home on Freetong Road with a transmitter between the toilet and the bathtub because that was the closest spot to the roof. Here, Mr. Rene, the books are out. They're now on Amazon, and we hope you enjoy them. Put together, we're going to talk about this this evening. Right, thank yes. you. Thank you. Definitely want to talk about this this evening. This is great stuff that, that is being done to preserve these parts of our history that are so important, so vital for us. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Celebration time! Grissy G and Dismas are preparing to make their television debut in Belize. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Belize Watch. It's a pleasure, honor, and a privilege to be with you on a lovely Tuesday evening. And what a show we have for tonight. We have the great this month. Welcome, Grizzy, Grizzy G. Yes, welcome. welcome. Thank you. And it's good to see you guys again. Glad to be here. And um, joining us this evening are some young folks and um, some average young folks, members of the Imperial Band. So we're going to make a mixture of music and folklore this evening. They have put together a book titled Legends of Belize, mm -hmm. um, a series about mythical creatures that dwell in the jungles and waters of Belize. It took us 10 years to write the book. 10 years to put this together. Right, with all the artwork. And we also put a lot of research into the different characters because we really wanted to tie it with the culture and also how we reflect in the world. But the older folks, also older folks who know about Tata Duhende, the younger folks are not too familiar with them. You, have you all found that out as well? Yeah. Yes, yes, that's why um, we started pursuing the book and continuing the series and took it so seriously because we saw that um, a lot of people, because of technology, they weren't talking to the family anymore and grandparents and these stories weren't being heard. I, I agree that because as a, as, as a child I can remember the Tata doing the stories indeed. There's the good that, part of him and, and then the bad, bad part, part of him, yeah. right? And um, mostly that basically how you behave and the how he react to you. Mm. So if you're a bad person, they hurt the jungle, they pollute. They you must behave yourself. You must behave. Right. And also, we, the, the thing we love about it is these stories that what make us as one culture. Of course. You know? And I want to thank you all and congratulate you on what thank you're you. doing. Bringing, uh, keeping our folklore alive, keeping these, these duendes alive. <laughs> you guys will be playing some music for us this evening. All right, well, if we're ready, make we beat out some music, man. Let's Ooh. hope that uh, Tata Duhende is listening and, um, you know, my show. Okay. This Tata Duende that wants to protect the forests may do useful work for Belize. The ecotourism sector is booming in the Cayo region, and the development of this promising industry is now a priority for this small Central American nation. Tourism already accounts for 12% of the local economy. We subscribe to ecotourism, leaving things as natural as we can. Per capita, we'd have more marine reserves, more forest reserves, more river reserves, more lagoon reserves than any country around us. If you want natural things as natural as they can be, this is Belize. Does the Tata Duende have a place in contemporary Belize? Absolutely, says historian Lita Krohn. If you ever get rid of Tata Duende, we're not going to be in good shape. We have to keep him right up front. He's a rebel. He's like saying, listen, if you can't take care of it, I've got to take care of it. And if I have to use scary tactics, I'm going to use scary tactics. That's the way the rainforest has survived. You know, I guess I was taught to fear the Duende. It was something that's scary, something you didn't want to run into. But um, eventually, as you get a little bit older, you realize that he's, a, he's a good guy. He's just doing his job, which is protecting this beautiful jewel that we have, protecting nature and a part of Mother Nature. To me, Tata Duende is just a folklore that was used to entertain. I haven't seen Tata Duende. <laughs> Some people say they have seen him. <laughs> In America, there are elves and fairies. 
very strong tradition of elves and fairy. The Tata Duende is like an elf or a fairy creature. I've never had the privilege of seeing him. I don't know if I really, you know, want to see him or not. I'm not too sure about that. Sometimes they would be reluctant to admit that they have seen them or that they believe in them because they don't want to be ridiculed or laughed at. Me, I don't care. <laughs> Laugh. I believe in them. People are cutting too much forest. The forest is their home, so we just cannot cut it for them. It's like somebody comes and put fire on my house, you know, then I don't have no home. And that's the same thing with them. And I don't think it does any harm to believe, nor does it do any harm not to believe, unless you're going to cut down a tree. <laughs> As for Grissy G and Dismas, they intend to continue their quest to restore the Tata Duende's legacy in Belize. It's an honor, like we're guardians of these myths, and now we have to make sure we can share them. When we started our series, there was a map of the amount of um, virgin forest in Belize, and it was a lot. And then, I mean, but quick, within three years of that, we started to look at these um, news things, uh, um, news articles and pictures that the forest is depleting like fast, acres and acres. So we really believe like a lot of these stories need to kind of come back and to remind people that this is important. This is life. This is what brings people to our country. So don't destroy, you know, you've exactly. got to take care of it because the Tata Duende is everywhere. Mm -hmm.